because I've smoked cigars with many women. Uh, it, it, with the problems that you're having with your kids, those things stay out there unless you want to share them. And then you'll find guys of different incomes and of different races and of different religions all engaging in the same conversation of, yeah, my kids are driving me crazy too. It's exactly the conversation you're having right now about her. How you doing? Thank you for being here, by the way. You picked the front row, so what's going to happen. It is an absolute pleasure to be here, and, and I do have the show uh, at WIBC, WIBC.com in Indianapolis, but I live in Los Angeles. It's okay, you can let it out. I'm, I'm, I'm very used to it. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's curious, it's interesting to see the, the connections between Detroit and, and Los Angeles. We both have uh, rather awful city governments. Um, we, we both have dealt with our fair share of corruption in city government. Neither one of us has a professional football team. You know how long I've had that in the pocket, kids? Waiting for a moment to use just that. I'm usually a walker when I, when I, when I talk, so this is, this is a, a unique thing, and I hope the microphone is good and I can be heard and all is right with the world. But in, in this conversation that I have, I have spoken uh, to groups uh, with AFP all across the country. During the 2012 election, I logged 250,000 miles, uh, air and bus. Uh, they had three bus tours going on all across the country. I'm the only person who was on all three buses at one time or another. It is absolutely the pleasure of a lifetime to run into people like you all over the country. So many people engage in these same conversations. And more and more, the conversation has so much less to do with political party and so much more to do with that's right and that's wrong. And why in the world can't we bring ourselves to admit when something's wrong? I was always told, I was always taught that the tough guy, the strong guy, the smart guy, the courageous guy admits when he has a problem. America, we have a problem. We have a taxation problem. We have had a taxation problem for far too long, and the only question is, when are we going to be courageous enough to do something about it, as opposed to kicking the can down the road? As opposed to telling those people who say we have a problem, no, 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 you're the problem for not paying your fair share, as if a government even knows what a fair share is. So I did a little research, I did a little history. The income tax, as we know it, 1913. It's been 101 years of the income tax. And I posit to you my thesis for the day, and you're allowed to quote me, Tony Katz, T-O-N-Y-K-A-T-Z, at Tony Katz on Twitter, that in 101 years of the income tax, we have absolutely, positively no value that has come from it. There is not a single good you can point to, not a single good anybody can point to. The video camera is rolling. There is not a single good that the federal income tax has ever created. Not a single one. We can talk about the first taxes that ever came, because there have always been taxes, but the idea of income taxes is the 1790s. Confrontations with France. It was the first time the federal government imposed any kind of direct taxes. It was on property, it was on land and homes, and disgustingly enough, slaves. Taxes. These were direct taxes as opposed to indirect taxes, which you pay is like a sales tax, where the shop owner is forced now to be in the collections business. That's what we do when we initiate a sales tax. The federal government doesn't believe that you would pay a tax. There is no trust, no faith, no belief in you. So they now have some store clerk acting as a governmental agency collecting from you. That's an indirect tax. Keeping the taxation hidden, if you will. Thomas Jefferson gets elected, and in 1802, direct taxes were abolished. Confrontations with France, they institute a tax. Jefferson comes in, the tax gets abolished. And for the next 10 years, there was no internal revenue tax. So, we have a moment in history where taxes were repealed. Keep that in the back of your minds. To for the War of 1812, we raised taxes. We did it on excise taxes, customs duties, and issuing treasury notes. But in 1817, the federal government, the Congress, repealed the taxes. And for 44 years, for 
44 years, there was no internal revenue collected. It's received revenue from customs, and, I love it, the sale of public land. And if the federal government would just engage in the sale of some public land, Clyde and Bundy could feed his cows. But they don't want to sell the land, and you heard Frank talk about it. You heard Frank discuss it. One of the things he didn't mention, according to sources, cell phone towers in the area are being cut to keep the communications from happening. Specifically, when I shoot a small video here and upload it to YouTube. You don't have the cell connection. It's kind of difficult to get that up and running. So we now have these two instances. I'm sorry, one, two, yeah, I have two. Two instances where the federal government has <coughs> repealed taxes. And it made me think, because these are the things that make you think. Let's assume, if we can, let us imagine, let us dream. There are dreamers in Detroit, aren't there? Let us dream together, if we can. Picture a restaurant, and the wine is flowing into the finest crystal glasses you've ever seen. And the steaks served perfectly. How do you like your steaks, sir? Rare. Rare? That is fine. That is well done. That is appreciated. And as opposed to getting your steak well done, which is horrific and shame on you. <laughs> Nobody should order their steak well done. That is not what God intended. <laughs> and I don't get mad at people who don't eat red meat. There's more for me. <laughs> the steak is perfect, just as you like it on the finest china, and the silverware is made with actual silver. It is one of those kinds of places. And at this dinner are three people, President Obama, Harry Reid, and Nancy Pelosi. Picture the following conversation twice. There's actually three times in history we've repealed income taxes. Picture this conversation. President Obama says to Harry and Nancy, hey, I got a crazy idea. It's happened in America before. Why don't, why don't we get rid of some of these taxes? Picture that happening. Laugh to yourself. Laugh out loud. In the knowledge that that can't happen, that won't happen, that is beyond their thinking, it is beyond the partisanship of who they are, the ideological rigidness of what they're about. But I ask you to replace them with George W. Bush, John McCain, and John Boehner. And you get the same result. So much of this conversation about taxation has somehow ended up in the idea of it's Republican versus Democrat. It's about conservative versus liberal. This is the nonsense conversation pushed forth by nonsense people who should be ridiculed and mocked and cast asunder. This is about right versus wrong. And right now we're getting wronged. But none of that conversation about uh, Barack and Nancy, and I, I call them Barack and Nancy, we're close. Uh, and, and, and did you just say sorry? Oh, that's hilarious. Well played. You're good. You're good. You brought her nicely done. None of that conversation about John Boehner and, and John McCain matters. Because this isn't about Congress doing any kind of repealing. We have, of course, the 16th Amendment, 1913. The worst year in American history, by the way. 1913 was the year of the income tax. I'll do a little audience participation. Two other things happened in 1913. Can you name them? No. Wait, wait, what was that? The Federal Reserve. One more. The direct election of senators. A total change in the Constitution. Three things, if you want to know where the wrong turn happened in history, the moment America became less than and worked down the road to less than, it's 1913. And Woodrow Wilson was president. The worst president in American history, present administration included. Quote me. Feel free. Spell my name right, so I'll ask. And what I think the unique things about the income tax, which I think is an unintended consequence, but truly the motivator for never really doing anything about it. Before the federal income tax, before the 1040 form, 
Exactly. What did the federal government know about us? What did they know about you? What did they really know about your work? There were some taxes at some times throughout history, and they did it based on income. There was a moment where if you made under $10,000, it was a flat tax of 3%, and over $10,000, it was a flat tax of 5%. You've got to think of the times of when this happened in the 1800s. $10,000 was a heck of a lot of money. Now it doesn't even get you a table at a presidential fundraiser. So the taxation that we see is not so much about the money, although it is about the money, it is about knowledge. It is about power. It is about control. And every time these subjects come up, and they do come up, and every time we engage these conversations, we're somehow told we're people with tinfoil hats. I'm, I am not wearing a tinfoil hat. I'll tell you about the NSA right now. As a matter of fact, if you could pull out your cell phones, I would very much like for them to hear every word I'm saying. <laughs> I actually stole that line from Ted Cruz, who has used it in a number of speeches. Can you please pull out your cell phones? I'd like the NSA to hear every word. Which is, I, I think, fine to steal from him. He stole from me speaking for 21 hours in a row. I was the first person ever to do it, and he said, I like what that cat skit has got going. I'm going to make that happen. We are far worse off because of the income tax. I'll go back to what I started with. What I, my thesis, if you will. That the United States income tax has done absolutely no good. It has benefited no one. It has created no value. It has not made things fairer, as if the federal government could even begin to comprehend and understand and define what's fair. Next, they're going to tell me that the living wage is real. As if somehow someone can calculate anywhere the living wage. You can tell me all the people who try. You can quote Krugman to me from now until the cows come home. But he's not right. He's wrong. He's an, he's an ignorant fool. I'm on video. I understand where I'm at, ladies and gentlemen. Quote me. The idea of the living wage. This woman's wearing a beautiful red top, and this woman's wearing a beautiful blue top, and this, oh, you should not have worn that shirt, but this guy's wearing a nice shirt. Everybody has different tastes and different ideas and different ideals. How in the world do you engage the concept of a living wage in that world? As a matter of fact, why would you? Isn't the living wage more of the controlling tactic nonsense that we have already seen doesn't work and destroys the society? It's the same exact conversation. The income tax has done no good. And part of the reason we have a taxation system set up the way we do is to keep things hidden from Americans so they don't quite understand what it is they're paying. Your taxes, you don't write a check. Picture if you had to write the check on April 14th for all of the taxes as opposed to the things that are withheld because they're doing you a favor. You see, the federal government loves you. They want to hold you warm in their bosom. They want to care for you. They want to cuddle. They just want to snuggle. That's all they want to do. They've got a snuggie built for two, and you are perfect for the other side. If they were honest people, you'd write a big check at the end of the year. But it is hidden. The Obamacare tax, I'm sorry, the Obamacare penalty, I apologize. The shared responsibility payment of Obamacare. They have a new word every single day. Um, I believe the next term is the ha ha screwed you penalty. <laughs> is not something that you write. You don't write a check for that. They take it out of your tax return. They have created an America of people who are excited to get their own money back and they're now giving you back less of your money to institute a policy that doesn't work and is more invasive than the income tax. Lucky us. I swear to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it back. Trust me. Come all the way with me. I will bring you home, I promise. The income tax is the single most divisive thing that has happened to Americans in its history. We can talk about class warfare, and race warfare, and gender warfare going on very prominent 
in the past five years. I do it all the time on radio. I have these conversations often, very often. But it all comes from the income tax and from this new idea of paying your fair share. The income tax is built and designed and utilized as a cudgel against the American people. It is meant to divide. It is meant to create the idea of the haves and the have-nots. It may not have been the total intent of the conversation when the states ratified this amendment, but somebody thought of it. Somebody may have had the idea, and certainly someone figured out, and many people have figured out, that this is exactly what we can do with it. If there was no income tax, what would be the thing that divides us? People who pay taxes wouldn't say, I pay too much, and people who don't pay taxes wouldn't say, you don't pay enough. The reliance would not be on federal government, but on private charity exactly the way it should be. This is not tinfoil hat. This is the honest look at what's happening to our society. This is where we're at. This is what has happened to us. And you want to discuss anger at the people of this in this room from the mainstream press and others. It's for noticing. Never are the elitists more angry than when you notice something. And then you actually talk about it. Man, do they hate the internet. And oh, do they hate talk radio. I am pretty sure I'm on a list. I know Frank is on a list. Frank is on many lists. Frank actually wrote a list, put his name on it, and sent it to them. <laughs> hey guys, just being helpful. Frank. We are not alone in this recognition. We're not alone in this reality. There are millions of people who recognize that this is a problem. The problem is that there aren't more. That's why we phone bank. That's why we knock on those doors. That's why we engage the conversations. That's why we share this stuff. That's why it's Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus. And if you don't know how to use any of that, first of all, you should. And secondly, if you don't do any of that, you know how to write something down, go make a hundred copies at your local printer and put them on windshields. Being a pamphleteer was good enough for Thomas Paine, but it's not good enough for us. I reject the premise. That was for you, my friends. You, I do that. One of my dearest listeners in Beautiful Eye Wings on Twitter, if you want to follow her. Um, there is no wrong way to move a message about saving a society. They can tell you that. They can give you reasons why that doesn't work. But the question is, why would you give me a reason about why I shouldn't be able to speak? President Obama once said too much transparency, too much communication, too much information puts a strain on a democracy. Life before the Gutenberg press put a strain on democracy. When you can't print books, when you can't share ideas, that was a life. Ben Franklin understood that you got to be printing. And it's a mess. Think of it then. A messy job. A dirty job. These plates were heavy, but you got to keep the information going out. Information is power. Didn't we just describe that? Didn't we just accept that as given fact when talking about the IRS? So why are we somehow so afraid to engage in information? If nothing more than a phone call to someone saying, hey, just so you know, this event is happening. Hey, just so you know, this is what's happening in Detroit. Hey, just so you know, this is what's happening in Michigan. Because not everything is on that, on that national level. I, I do work with Fox, I do work with CNBC. I write for Town Hall, I write for Rare, I write for Christian Post. I've been fortunate in, in my conversations on, on a national level. But my strength on that level is not any more important than Frank Beckman's strength right here. He is actually more important and more valuable. We seem to, for the desire, and this happens in, in, in my industry, the desire to be seen, to be nationally recognized, to be able to sign 100 autographs, 
I would like to have an effect. I would like to make a difference. I would like to drive home a point, and I would like to change people's minds, attitudes, hearts, belief, and willingness. What are you in it for? If information is power, how much information are we sharing? And exactly how much more powerful are they than we when we start sharing it? Frank talked about the videos from Nevada. Clive and Bundy. Uh, if you didn't hear, if you don't know Dana Lash, who I fill in for on a regular basis, she's also on The Blaze, uh, now uh, nationally syndicated. She did a fantastic interview with Clive and Bundy, talking about the issue and talking about the problem. And you could say, could engage in arguments, a conversation, if you will, that somehow, because he has paid Nevada for the grazing fees, but not the federal government for the grazing fees, because they keep changing the rules, change the rules on him, then maybe somehow he's in the wrong. You could, I guess, if you wanted to, argue that. But the Bureau of Land Management sent 200 men with automatic weapons to ensure we can get some cows away from some turtles. The story, as they want you to hear the story, is about some crazy rancher who's on a jihad to keep his cows happy and doesn't care about the poor, lonesome, desert tortoise. First of all, I could care less about a turtle. I don't mean it any particular harm. I'm not going out of my way to make any soup. But in a choice between cows and turtles, I already told you my love of steak. And I don't appreciate these people keeping steak from me. And I want it to be naturally fed. I don't want any of that hormone nonsense. The land is there. I say let them have a lovely meal. 200 guys shutting down of cell phone towers, free speech zones. <coughs> they understand the need for power. And they in this one instance, which just happened, I could not have planned this if I desired to. They have decided that the most important thing they can do is eliminate your ability to communicate, which is to cut off your power. Information is power. If we don't start sharing it with people, we lose. And being in Detroit, being in Motown, if you will. Uh, I, I thought it important to quote uh, one of our founders who, who said something very uh, profound. I want to quote Franklin, um, not Ben, Aretha. Uh, she didn't know she was being brilliant, but uh, turns out, uh, yes. Uh, and and I, I have the lyrics here because I, I believe that Ms. Franklin deserves the proper R-E-S-P-E-C-T. R-E-S. Did you just groan? Did you just owe me? Did you, you're the one who heckled Frank? I'll have you removed. I'm not shy. The song is Think. I'm not going to sing it, but if I did, oh damn, would it be good? <laughs> you better think. Yeah, you see all that? You, you all saw Blues Brothers. <laughs> think about what you're trying to do to me. Yeah, think. think. Let your mind go. Let yourself be free. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go way back, way back when. I didn't even know you. You couldn't have been too much more than ten. I ain't no psychiatrist. I ain't no doctor with degrees or a constitutional scholar. She took that line out. It don't take too much high IQ to see what